to the client on the receiving end. So this isn't something that's going to work through a firewall, but for some reason, apparently there's scenarios out there where, where, where potentially um, this is going to be useful. So they've defi defined a binding for this. Now, the, again, the real interesting point here is that the, the, the receiving end, the client, actually opens up a listening port that has almost a, a lightweight web, service, ru uh, web server running on it. It uses the, uh, the HTTP API, which is the same API that IIS 7 uses. Um, and the way it works is the client initially informs the server of its URL and its host name. I'm sorry, it's URL and it's port number. And then the server acknowledges that by sending a, an acknowledgement request back to the, to the client. And once that happens, the two-way communication starts. So there's something really weird that, or interesting, I should say, that happens here. Um, this is just a, a vanilla use case. This is sort of the intended use case. The client initially makes its request to the service. It basically makes an, an, a create sequence request, which you can see there in the action, and it tells the service where to reply to. So it says, okay, reply to me on port 8000 at my host name. The, um, the service is then going to send an acknowledgement request. Uh, it's basically a create sequence response request back to the client on that port and, and to that URL and to that port, and then it's going to send an accepted message back as the response to the original create sequence request. And then if all goes well, the client's going to send an accepted response back to the service. And at this point, sort of a handshake has occurred and the two-way communication begins. So that's sort of the intended use case. The important thing here, again, is that we've got two different sessions going on. One between the client and server over port 80, the other between the server and the client over port 8000. Now let's look at a different scenario. This involves two machines, or three machines, a client, the same service, and then a machine we'll call target. So the client sends its create sequence request to the service, except this time, if you'll notice in the reply to address, it says reply to target on port 8000. So what the service is going to do is it's going to send that create sequence response to the target on port 8000. It's then going to send back the client an accepted message, and then the target obviously didn't solicit this request, so it's just going to kind of be like, you know, what's going on here? Chances are that port's not even open. So in most cases, this is going to time out, or it's going to just, uh, it's going to get a reset because the port was closed. So building on this scenario, let's say we have two targets. If we do that exact same thing, we issue our create sequence request to target one. Target one gets this request from the service that it didn't ask for. The service sends us back an accepted response. Now let's say we follow it up with a second create service request to target two. Well, interestingly, nothing here is going to happen. Whoops. Sorry about that. I just hit the end button. Okay, so we send our create sequence request to target one. It sends its, the request to target one, sends us back and accepted. We're going to go ahead and follow up with a second request, create sequence request to target two. Nothing is actually going to happen here until that timeout occurs. Only after that timeout occurs is the service going to then send that second create sequence request to target two and send us back an accepted message. And then, of course, that's going to time out as well. So the key part of this whole thing is that nothing happened on that second request until that first request timed out. So what we can do here is we can actually enumerate the state of the previous request based off of that delay that the server has in responding to us when we issue a follow-up create sequence request. So what we can do is we can use this time delay to actually figure out whether the previous connection was successful or not. So what we did here is sort of a proof of concept is we, we figured out that this can be an effective way to sort of port scan a machine using this delay to figure out whether the port was open or not. So if you look at a typical, this is a, a, an actual create sequence request. Um, the, the important point here is this reply to address, and that's going to be the machine that you want the service to try and connect to. So what we'll do is I'll show you a quick example of what that looks like in repeater. Um, I've got a, a, an actual duplex uh, web service running on, our, uh, on one of our VMs. So I'm going to have it connect to um, the local host on port 88. 
I'm connecting to, the port, to, to that same host on port 88, so I know that there's a web server listening. Um, again, this is kind of hard to see, but really, as long as you see that line down here, the accepted, that's really all that matters. So if I go ahead and issue this request, you can see that the accepted message comes back pretty quickly. I can do another one, comes back pretty quickly. I can do another one, it's going to come back pretty quickly. Now, if I actually do uh, a bogus host name here that won't resolve, I'll send that request in, comes back pretty quick. I send a second request, and you can see that it doesn't actually come back that quick. And the reason for that is that the service is trying to resolve the host name that I just asked it to connect to previously, and until that re resolve request times out, it's not going to even think about processing this request. So first, we can actually connect to other machines. We can also connect to different ports on this same machine. Um, so is it the host resolution that's timing out, or is it actually? In this case, it's the host resolution. What I can do now is let's go back to localhost, and I'll go back to port 88, and let's just make sure that our connections are, are happening here. Now what I can do is I can say connect to 89. The first one comes back. The second one, it's hard to tell here, but it came back a little slower. If I actually go to 135, you can see that now it's actually hanging because if you try to connect over HTTP to port 135, it kind of just hangs until uh, the Windows and the BIOS service sort of chokes, at which point this will come back. So rather than just sort of do this haphazardly manually, we figured this really was probably worthy of automating to really figure out um, how effective this is. So what we did was we created a port scanner that um, essentially does this exact same thing in an automated fashion, connecting to any web service that uses this binding. The nice thing is it works behind a firewall, so if we want to try and probe machines in the same DMZ, we can. Um, and it's a little slow, but it's effective. So you can see what happens is the first probe, really, we don't care about the response time. It's only the second probe um, that tells us the response time from the first probe, and so on and so forth. So as an environment to do our test, we actually did the, um, we actually used the, the Microsoft Azure cloud service. And we didn't know this at the time, but as it turns out, this was actually a perfect environment to do a test, because if you look at the way the Azure cloud infrastructure is, um, is designed, all of the, the, the VMs are actually on a private 10.0 network. And those are internally, those are um, natted inbound to externally resolvable IPs based off the customer and what VMs they're using. So if I have a, a you know, myapp.cloudapp.net, that maps internally to one of those 10 dots, um, those VMs on the 10.0 network. So the way the, um, the, the tool runs is it has two options. One, you can just probe a single host on a, in a range of ports on a single host. The other one is you can probe multiple hosts on the same port. And if we look at the results of what happened when we first ran this on our cloud app, um, we knew that our machine was on the 10.115.213 subnet. We knew that just because we uploaded some code that would echo out the, the, the IP address. And if you do this, we actually scanned the different, all the machines on that subnet on port 20,000. The reason we picked 20,000 was that also based off our testing, we knew that IIS on the VMs, for some reason, they don't run it on port 80. They run it on port 20,000. So we wanted to see what other VMs on that subnet had IIS running. And you can see here that all the responses either took greater than 7 seconds or less than 0.2 seconds. So using that, we're able to infer what machines have that port open. We actually confirmed this by uploading fscan to the box and running a, a, a scan against those machines as well, just to confirm that the, uh, that the results were the same. By that same token, we also scanned our local host. Um, we just picked a small range right around the terminal services port, so 3387 to 3393. And as you can see here, all those response times, again, they were either about 1.1 seconds or less than, um, or they time out around seven seconds. And of course, the only one that came back um, with that timeout was 3389, which is a good indicator that, that terminal services is running on that machine. So um, again, that tool is just more of a proof of concept tool. Um, it's on our website as well to download along with the code if anybody's interested. So the last thing I want to talk about is um, secure bindings. And I know it's 250. How much time do we have left? Five minutes? Okay. So the last scenario we'll talk about is secure bindings. 
Um, I, I have a demo for this, but we probably won't do it, but I'll just sort of hit the relevant points here. Um, the key about security